like to share a little bit about spiritualism with you. We're going to be drawing from Arthur Conan Doyle's history of spiritualism. Now, we talked briefly uh, a short time ago about the Quakers and their experience. Uh, going to add a little bit more to that. Uh, now, previously, I may have mistakenly said and assumed that it was the Native Americans that were coming through, but it wasn't just them. There were other other spirit entities that came through with the Quakers, which caused a lot of alarm with them. Uh, actually, it was the Native Americans who were the more polite ones. Uh, they were the ones who asked permission from those who they were working through. And Doyle goes on to say that the physical phenomena appears to be strong with the Native Americans, but there was none of the higher teachings as is accustomed with the European and Oriental spirits. Now, I don't know about that, but I can say that one of the advantages that the Native American Indians had over some of the European uh, entities that came through is their heritage within shamanism because you know when we look back in the long history of the shaman practices and everything you know one of the definitions of shaman is master of spirits so they were essentially ahead of the game with a lot of the the other people that may have came through. And I should also add that, you know, the Native Americans were the longest ones practicing shamanism. Now, the practice of being a shaman was not exclusive to the Native Americans here. It was also part of all of the earlier uh, Native peoples in all of the countries. Uh, the Bush Natives of Australia they most likely still continue their version of the shaman as well as well some of the african bush people as well now uh, shaman were also part of the the development of civilization in china <clears throat> so that gives you an idea of, of how far back it goes. And I, as I'm sure I mentioned earlier, the, the images and the cave paintings, uh, particularly the Salon of Bulls, where it appears to spiral into a smaller chamber, that's actually something that many of the practicing shaman have described to authors such as uh, Whitley. Uh, how what they experience when they traverse from this plane to the next. So there's there's a lot of rich information with the early shaman if you get an opportunity to research any of that. And F. W. Evans, who was considered to be intelligent among the Shakers, determined what this sudden eruption of spirit activity meant. And he reduced this to three phases. The first is the proof of the phenomena. The second is the phase of learning from the phenomena. And then the third phase is the application of what is learned. Uh, many of us experience the first phase. This is how we typically become introduced into spiritualism. And the second phase is questionable. Sometimes people graduate from the first phase into the second phase. Sometimes they don't. And, you know, and again, even fewer move from the second phase into the third phase. Uh, the third phase uh, is a good example of that. It will be our book class that Rachel will be leading us with Paul Selig. 
That is an example of the second and third phases. So that gives you an idea. Uh, any comments or questions? So you had said that um, when Indians came through, he had noted that there wasn't as much of the higher teachings. Is that the phrase you used? That was the phrase he used. What did you understand that to mean? Well, when we look at the, when I look at the higher teachings, I look at this third phase, you know, people applying what they're learning, um, something more than, I think it was Horace Greeley and his friend who commented at a seance that uh, many of the sitters were more interested in the goings on of uh, loved ones and celebrities, and very few were inquiring about life in life's other rooms um, the purpose of the communication and in that type of information uh, that's what i would call the higher teachings uh, i have been exposed to some where there were no teachings coming through it was the phenomena uh, there was a convention I was in attendance of. Uh, I forget where this was at. I want to say Laporte, but I'm not sure. And at this convention, one of the ministers was, was possessed by a spirit. Uh, I forget the name. I want to say Mammy, but I'm not sure. Uh, the language usage and mannerisms uh, indicated someone of uh, African descent. But when the spirit came through her and she began to speak and such, it was more the impression I got was that it was a surprise to her. It was something that she was not accustomed to. But I also want to add that those who were also present among the membership, uh, well, they burst out laughing and, and such. They found it, uh, uh, my perception of them was they found it entertaining. So now I'd also like to suggest that higher teachings may imply that uh, when we, some of us have gone to see trance mediums and they have have inf presented information to us that's that some would consider very valuable higher teachings um you know that may be what's indicated here but uh, i would say it would be something more than the mundane stuff that you would pick up out of the national Enquirer. <laughs> So does anyone else have any thoughts they'd like to share? Yes. So I don't, I don't remember now exactly what um, the practice was when Native Americans would hunt. I know that they would pray to the spirit of the animal and I forget whether they would ask permission for that, you know, to take that life for it to be used for their life. But I guess it made somewhat sense to me that they might be a little bit more reverent about merging energy with somebody. So that was interesting. I would be in agreement. Uh, I don't know a whole lot about uh, Native American heritage, so I apologize for that. But it does make sense. Uh, I know much of what I have encountered is along those same lines. And that seems to be the, the theme here, particularly with the the principles, uh, the spiritual principles, the philosophy aspect that Andrew Jackson Davis promoted. Uh, it was nature-based 
And what I mean by nature based, it was more along the lines of observations of nature in applying those lessons there to our lives, such as the what we call the, the natural law of acceptance or the natural law of least resistance that comes from watching the water or a stream meander its way to wherever it's going. And whenever it encounters an obstacle, it just it either goes underneath it or goes around it or even goes over it. But the obstacle does not control it. So, you know, there's a lot to learn just by by that. Even the wind, uh, the path of least resistance. Uh, when the winds, I mean, I think Chicago has the reputation of the windy city. It's because of the winds that come through there and all the buildings that are there. It just channels, it may channel the wind, but the buildings do not prevent the wind from, from blowing through. It finds the path of least resistance. So that's what's implied with it. Uh, Wicca, which uh, has morphed into the term of witch, um, their beliefs and practices, if I recall correctly, are nature-based, as well as a lot of the so-called pagan religions. Now, pagan is just a term that implies those religions before Christianity. Why that happened, I don't know, but that's the way they delineated that. So a lot of those religions were all based on nature, observations of nature. Even their higher teachings are based on observations of nature, which we discussed uh, during the winter solstice and the, the spring equinox just recently with Easter. So there's a lot of that that comes into play that sometimes some of the contemporary religions may, may gloss over. I don't want to say they ignore, but gloss over. Well, I had a curiosity about something that you brought up and um, wondered what all of you might think of this, what your thoughts are on it. You had said that most people um, don't really ask about, you know, ask the higher questions. And I found that to be kind of congruent with the experience that I've had um, in observing some people with mediums or whatnot, even with Paul Selig, when um, I'm on a, uh, I'm watching him answer questions from callers or this or that, um, I'm sitting there with questions like, ask how you maintain the higher frequency, you know? <laughs> um, things pertinent to our development and what you get is, is my cat going to be okay? Or <laughs> these, <laughs> these, <laughs> along with relationship questions. And I, I just, I guess I'm curious what um, your guys' thoughts are. Um, I've worked with people in mental health and uh, social services for years. And the majority of people who I come across either have no um, interest in the spiritual or God, um, you know, or it's loose. Every, you know, one out of 10 maybe are really focused on that. What do you guys think? Is it okay if I join in here? <laughs> Please. Um, yeah. As a hypnotist, I, I've run into very similar situations where people will ask for just really mundane things, or they're so caught into their story and what's going on in their head about, you know, predicting a certain outcome unconsciously. And um, what I find and, and what I enjoy about the hypnotic aspect of this is instead of me being a medium, 
and giving them a message, I'm able to take them into trance and guide them to have an experience where they get a message and like I can just gently lead them through a safe journey where they're not afraid. Um, because what I what I find is sometimes asking these deeper questions, um, people are, their identity is so attached with their role in life or who they think they are, who they've been told they are. So part of it is, is, you know, just gently guiding them into this trance where those layers just fall off. Just like when you go into the deepest of sleep, it, it's not the absence of awareness, it's the awareness of absence. Right. And it's in that space that the messages come. And what's more important to me when I'm working with them like that is the transformation from the experience, not whether or not they remember anything. So then they kind of go back into that forgetfulness, go back into their story. But things are different. They're lighter and changes happened. I like that. That's pretty empowering for the people. And um, the one thing that I found is, is that the universe has not called us all to be mediums. The universe has not called us all to be super excited about the spiritual. Um, those who have been called, we get to be the intercessors for those who have other jobs. And it's totally okay for them to be totally blind to that aspect of awareness. It's, it's almost like we're a team. And our job is to help them stay in their lane. And when they when they start moving and bumping into other people and their lives become unbalanced, we can leave them with an impression that is changing. That's that's excellent because science also suggests the same thing that you suggested. And that's that we are all not called to be mediums, as you put it. And the way they present it is that was nature's design because with that it makes both parties so to speak dependent on each other i like that perspective too because it uh it really encompasses some acceptance and i guess you know growing up i felt like i was so different so it was like, there's these people who are not deep thinkers, and then there's me. And sometimes I make those people uncomfortable because they don't want to think about the things that I do. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but I, I like that, uh, you know, we're just all a different variety or, you know, in different places. And that's, Okay. Mm -hmm. So Reverend Thomas, is there anything you would like to add to this? Uh, it's uh, been my observation that uh, um, it's, it seems to me that most people that would call themselves religious are, um, are happy with being told what they're to believe and to do. Okay, so they can check that box and just get that out of the way and go on with their life. They're, uh, they're not interested in the deep dive or putting the time or questioning things and all of that. Um, and as was nicely stated before, that's not everyone's calling. And that's, that's okay. Um, and, uh, but that is kind of the difference that some of us are I've always, I've always just self-described myself as uh, born as a doubting Thomas. And, um, you know, I wasn't an easy kid to have in the Catholic catechism classes, you know. <laughs> I uh, <clears throat> frequently asked uh, questions that the uh, priest was not, not ready to, uh, you know, just, <laughs> you know, let's just move on. Uh, and when I, and when I attended, uh, uh, some some Baptist Bible studies um, that didn't go well either. 
I had too many questions, things that they just take for granted and, and go on. So it's, I think for me, that's why, um, you know, I found myself in small groups like this repeatedly on my own path. And, um, and it may be one of the reasons why we may never have to build a cathedral to hold all the people that want to come to one of our services or to our services on Sunday. And, uh, and that's okay too, because uh, for me, I, I uh, appreciate, um, you, you know, the personal experience and, um, um, uh, and the opportunity to uh, have others to do the deep dive with. And uh, because I am very curious about that, which I, I term, I like to just call spirituality. It's that spiritual path and discovering more about us, why we're spiritual beings having this human experience and, uh, and how to balance all of that and, and still, uh, you know, remain in the world. Thank you. Uh, Sandy, would you like to add anything? Um, just that this is this is a, a great line of questioning. It's just it, it's and what you brought up today is just so so great. Um, and and a, just a little funny coincidence this morning, I was thinking before church started about um, the Indian heritage of this country and um, uh, and how as as a culture and as a people how beautiful they were and how spiritual and how totally in tune to uh to nature that uh indian cultures uh were and um how as i guess pristine they were before everyone came in <laughs> and essentially over time tried to destroy them and um, and I, I just I was just thinking to myself what the significance of that. That's such a broad question, and it can't be answered in a sentence. But um, uh, the significance of of uh, of that experience that that people came from Europe uh, and other parts of the world, and you know, essentially came into this country and eventually pushed them away uh, out and made them mortal enemies and um sometime maybe we could have a chance to talk about that because i i just find it a very fascinating subject is how that all what what the spiritual significance of some of that was and as a culture were they um was this something they had to experience as a as a society as a culture and I, I, and questions we may never have answers to, but anyway, it just was interesting that you brought up uh, the Indian experience this morning because before church, I was having a conversation with myself about it. <laughs> so it's all just, and, and this was great. This was great. Good. Great, great talk. Mm -hmm. Good. Fantastic. Sharon, is there anything you would like to add? Um, I don't think so. I also find this very fascinating as well. And, and I, uh, there were some things in the paper yesterday about something about, um, I don't know if anybody heard about this or not, and I'll make this brief, but there was something in the newspaper about, I believe it was the Wounded Knee Massacre and um, how they are, they've been trying, the, the tribes, I think it's the o Ogala Sioux, they've been trying to get, uh, uh, apparently, some of the cavalry, they were given medals for assassinating these women and children and killing all these people, and they were given medals for it. And apparently, the Sioux have been trying to get these medals, get this taken away, that they shouldn't have gotten medals for killing women and children. And so there was something in the paper about this yesterday. So it was kind of on my mind as well, Sandy, when you mentioned that, because I was thinking, Raymond and I had a conversation about it too, but, um, you know, 
as a and and a lot of cultures over the years you know have disappeared over time and maybe this one will as well but you know you you do wonder as a like sandy said as a culture what what was their purpose um you know why were they I don't know. It like Sandy said, it's a hard question and it's something we could certainly talk for hours about. But I, it, I have a soft spot in my heart for them, and I always have. I've never liked movies to watch cowboy movies where Indians get killed, and I don't like that. I don't like watching anything like that. It's always been, it just oh, could can't do it. So, so yeah, I. Do have a soft spot in my and I I believe that I have been told at one time too that I I did have a an Indian incarnation I'm sure I did I I know it so that probably is part of why I feel the way I do but um, yeah anyway so yeah that's that's all I have to say but it, it is a really interesting topic and it it's and it's kind of sad that a a, a culture of people that is so spiritually attuned becomes the victims become the victims um yeah i i you know i'd like to know what is the what is the purpose of that as a culture uh, as a as a religion if you want to call it that as a spiritual practice why why are they persecuted why were they persecuted so i i'd be curious i, I haven't read much about it really but it is it is interesting question so Hmm. That's it. <laughs> okay, thank you. Beth, would, do you have anything you'd like to add? Oh, I, I just concur. This would be a, um, a great line of study. You add to your list, Reverend Philip. <laughs> <laughs> to teach a course on. I will definitely add it to my list. <laughs> And we may get to it, but I don't know, maybe in two years. <laughs> <laughs> the list is long, eh? It, it, yes, yes. But, uh, you know, I thank all of you for, for these suggestions and that, because that's what keeps me occupied and expands my learning base as well as yours. So thank you very much for your input on that. Thank you, Rachel, for for the questions and, and what you've added to that. It's very much appreciated. Thank you.